It's 2021. Donald Trump was not re-elected, and Joe Biden has ascended to the helm of a blue wave that's overtaken the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives in equal measure. Liberals throughout the land have rejoiced, vowing to return America back to the sort of place they know it to actually be. Never mind that the messaging of returning to a better time is noticeably similar to yesterday's Make America Great Again. America is back, ready to lead the world, not retreat from it. Once again, sit at the head of the table, ready to confront our adversaries and not reject our allies, ready to stand up for our values. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, together, we will make America great again. Never mind that one alleged rapist has been replaced with another, or that the Democrats followed the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 by shoehorning a man into office whose record includes voting in favor of racial segregation and championing the 1994 crime bill, a watershed moment in the explosive growth of America's prison industrial complex which disproportionately affects black people and people of color. Wait, where was I? Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Progressives, Moderates, Conservatives, Young, Old, Urban, Suburban, Rural, Gay, Straight, Transgender, White, Latino, Asian, Native American. I mean it, especially those moments, and especially those moments when this campaign was at its lowest ebb, the African American community stood up again for me. Ah, yes, making America complacent again. I bring up the election because I wanted to draw your attention to this map here. And for fun, let's throw this little number from 2016 up here. Hell, we can do a few more. Let's go back 20 years or so. Notice any trends? Maybe if we overlay them. If you've paid any attention at all to American electoral politics in the last couple of decades, none of this will be surprising to you. Yes, the coasts are generally blue, and most everything between them is red. If you zoom into each state by county, you'll find further unsurprising trends. Urban areas are blue, and rural areas are red. And while, yes, there are occasional exceptions to these trends, they've basically become textbook at this point. And before I go any further, I want to ask you to take a moment to consider why this might be. Why do rural areas overwhelmingly tend to vote Republican? If I say someone is from a red state, what sort of person do you picture? If I ask you to imagine a rural Trump voter, what do they look like? What do they talk like? Why? Now, your answer will almost certainly vary based on where you're from and your own political allegiances. So let me address one specific group. If you are American from a blue state or a county and do not vote Republican, what descriptors came to mind? Poor? White? Racist? Interesting. Were there any others? Perhaps redneck, hick, or something about their intelligence? Are they stupid? Backwards? Or simply uneducated? If you thought any of these things, then you aren't alone. CNN and many mainstream media sources ran similar stories during both the 2016 and 2020 elections, placing heavy stress on the voting habits among college-educated people versus those without college education as a reason for Trump's popularity. Look at all these red states, they smugly proclaimed. See how foolish their uneducated populace is. And while it is true that the majority of college-educated people tend to vote blue, and the majority of those without higher education tend to vote red, to see that as a simple lack of intelligence among Republican voters is to miss the institution of the forest for the statistical convenience of the trees. And that's not even the entire problem. I'm going to shift my attention now from those who grew up in liberal areas to those who grew up in rural parts of one of these uneducated red states. I don't care what your current political allegiances are, I just have a couple of questions for you. 
Was there ever a time you felt that you've been looked down on by others in more affluent liberal areas simply for being from a certain state? How did that affect you? Because as a Kentuckian, I can say that it once brought me dangerously close to the arms of a fascist worldview. And while, yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing I try to fight against now, the way that people from other places talk about us, or just as often, don't, is not helping. And if you think I'm just talking to the liberals in the audience here, I'm not. But you're going to have to watch the rest of the video to know exactly what I mean by that. There is probably no topic on God's green earth more complicated for me to talk about than my feelings on rural Kentucky or the broader American South. You ever talk to a Southern queer? It ain't exactly paradise for us down here. Southern trans lesbian is not really something I ever aspired to be. I guess it kind of was, but not because I had any sort of delusions about what that would mean for me what it would mean to be even suspected of being okay. Maybe it's different for those who grew up in a southern city, but for those of us who grew up two hours from the nearest one, the so-called Bible Belt is anything but utopian. But that's not to say I hate everything about Kentucky or the South. I love being from the home of both bourbon and bluegrass. Luna, Kentucky, keep on shining. I love that I got to spend so many weekends growing up camping in the woods without a tent, that I know how to start a fire and how to take a fish off a hook, even if I don't love doing it and am notoriously bad at it. I enjoy shooting guns, and I love how anti-authoritarian it all used to be. More on that later. I love the whole who gives a shit about being fancy vibe that I grew up with. And, to be honest, I love being able to say, what's your iga kintajijin? And seeing the shock that appears on people's faces when all they expect is this. Wait, 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 wait a second. You're telling me I flew all the way to Kentucky to get some of your fried chicken and, and the colonel isn't even working today? He, we, he did. What? I say he did. Is Mr. Sanders in? What's wrong with you? I say you, he did. The Colonel! Like I said, it's complicated. I love being from here, but I hate having been subjected to so much as a result of being from here. So this is the point in the video where I disclose that the political bent that I have now is not the one I have always had. By the time I got into high school and had started developing some sort of political identity, I knew I wasn't a Republican, but I wasn't exactly a Democrat either. The few liberals I knew growing up were all smug, arrogant bastards, and the Democratic Party was the very distillation of that. And you know what? The conservatives in my life were all pretty anti-institution. They weren't registered Republicans, but rather independents who just happened to always vote Republican. And despite any inherent hypocrisy that that may entail, it made sense to me as a teenager. So when I finally registered to vote, it was as an independent. But 2008 was the year I graduated high school, and I spent my junior and senior years supporting not Obama or McCain, but the other candidate, the libertarian Ron Paul. And I also actively began identifying as a libertarian. Had I had the vocabulary to do so back then, I would have probably identified as an anarcho-capitalist, but honestly, libertarian worked just fine. Functionally, they would have meant the same thing to me anyway. Libertarianism offered me a third way, not the Westboro Baptist Church Republican, nor the fuck the ignorant poor Democrat, but a path which actively sought to end foreign interventionism and lessen the size and influence of our government. Legalize everything, stop policing people for living a different sort of life, and leave me in peace. And to be quite honest, there's still a lot of that that I believe in now. Just, you know, without the inherent belief that capitalism is somehow the greatest system on Earth. A friend of mine once described libertarianism as the ideology of the closeted southern white gay. And, I mean, 
Yeah, it is. If you fit in with Southern society, then you're a Republican. If you don't, or you're rich, you could swing Democrat. But if neither of those really fit you for some reason, then you might just be a libertarian. Or at least, you were in 2008. Remember, I was 18 at the time. I had no real understanding of economic theory, no real understanding of what capitalism was. I only knew that the place I was from was not rich, and that the people around me wanted lower taxes, and that sounded logical to my brain. If they had so little, what right did the government have to take any of it away? I was too young and sheltered at the time to realize that Kentucky and most of rural America was being subsidized by rich blue states with higher tax rates, to realize that higher taxes actually mean having money for social programs that can help the working class. The only institutions I knew that helped people who needed it were the, generally extremely conservative, local churches. The only socialists I knew of were in faraway countries I knew basically nothing of. There were no leftists distributing bread in my town. I never even heard the term leftist until well into college. But again, we'll get to that. No one ever told me about Ron Paul's racist and homophobic history, his conspiratorial mindset, or his support of far-right militia groups. I didn't see that, for all its promise of freedom and non-interventionism, American libertarianism was a pipeline to fascism. And so, by extension, the libertarian culture I grew up in was especially susceptible to defaulting to fascism as well. But how could an ideology centered on individual liberty be so susceptible to such authoritarianism? I am so glad you asked. I really don't want to get too in the weeds with defining the differences between various political ideologies here, but I also don't want to go any further without giving at least a little setup. And to do that, I'm going to draw upon this little gentleman here, the political compass. Quick disclaimer, the political compass is imperfect. It is impossible to fully account for nuanced differences in belief when one is confined to a two-axis spectrum. But it works for the sake of simple demonstration and arguments, and that is all I'm trying to do with it here. If you look at the political compass, you'll see that it is divided along two axes. The north-south axis refers to social structure and ranges from authoritarian to libertarian. East-west is economic, from the capitalist right to the socialist left. Now, one of the first questions newbies to this might ask is what I mean by libertarian. In all parts of the world outside of the U.S., libertarian refers to ideologies within this quadrant, which is anti-authoritarian and economically left. Since the 1950s, however, American capitalists have co-opted the term to fit this quadrant, which is still anti-authoritarian but economically right. This is why libertarian means something different in the U.S. than it does elsewhere. When I say libertarian in this video, I mean right libertarian, not left. Fascism, meanwhile, is up in this quadrant, which is authoritarian and economically right. So already, you'll notice one similarity between American libertarianism and fascism in their shared position on the economic right. However, their position on the north-south axis is different. Fascists are authoritarian, libertarians are anti-authoritarian. It is important to note that anyone or anything can theoretically be plotted to this compass. So Ron Paul, being extremely pro-capitalist and relatively anti-authoritarian, would be here. Contrast this with George Bush, whose economic policy is nearly as far right as Ron Paul, but who is explicitly more authoritarian. He would be about here. And just because, let's look at Barack Obama. Somewhat economically left of Bush, very marginally less authoritarian. He goes here-ish. Notice how close these two are. Interesting. So anyway, that pipeline I was talking about. 
While libertarianism and fascism share an affinity for similar economic systems, the social structure of each is completely different. You would think an American libertarian would be as anti-fascist as, well, any of these people. But when you see this flag or hear Tea Party, both of which are products of the American libertarian movement, do you think anti-authoritarian? Because I don't. I think even more pro-authority than your standard Republican. But how and why did that shift happen? Now that, friends, is the very reason I made this video. A 2015 report by Quantum Communications in Lebanon sought to understand what led people to join ISIS. In order to better understand this, researchers collected and studied 49 video interviews of current and former ISIS members. The sample size of this study is small and imperfect, but such is the nature of studying a decentralized extremist group. From that study, the researchers determined nine primary reasons why people join ISIS. Some of these are not relevant to this essay at all, but a few, notably, are. These include the so-called identity seekers, the revenge seekers, the responsibility seekers, and the justice seekers. Oh my, that's almost half of them. So what defines these four types of people who join ISIS? Identity seekers are those who feel like outsiders, surrounded by an alien environment, and who thus seek an identity through becoming part of a group. Revenge seekers are different in that they do consider themselves to be part of a repressed group, in this case a group being repressed by the West. The responsibility seekers are simply those who join out of a need to provide financial or material support for their families. And finally, the justice seekers are those whose only reason to join is to fight a perceived generalized injustice. It has become standard after any major terrorist attack in the world for ISIS to claim responsibility. Sometimes this can be verified, and sometimes it cannot. It might seem strange that a group would want to take ownership of an atrocity, especially if they were not actually responsible for it, but doing so is a well-known strategy for recruitment. As demonstrated by the types of recruits I just detailed, those who join ISIS very often do so either out of a desire to be part of a group identity, or those who feel that their group has been wronged in some way or another, or very often, both. The non-Muslim world is already deeply and overtly Islamophobic, which means that Muslims in non-Muslim nations often feel looked down on, excluded, alienated, or even outright hated by the non-Muslim people around them. Claiming responsibility for an atrocity further stokes those flames of Islamophobia, further isolating those alienated Muslim people. The perception towards Muslim refugees in the US and Europe has, in turn, led to some draconian attempts at banning such refugees into those places. And where do those alienated refugees, spit on by the very people they fled to for sanctuary, have to go then, but straight into the arms of ISIS? People are social creatures, after all. We all crave to be a part of some sort of community. They look down on you, ISIS whispers into those alienated people's ears. They hate you. They bombed your house killed your family and your friends, left your homeland a war-torn hell. They eat steak and get fat in front of their televisions while you starve and freeze and die. Is that right? Are you going to let them treat you that way, simply for being born where you were born? For worshipping the god of your fathers? There is no more effective strategy for recruiting people into an extremist ideology than to alienate them and make them feel hated by all those around them, and to make them feel as though they are a target simply for their identity. ISIS does it because it works, and fascists have likewise always done the same. 
There has been no dearth of ink spilled nor tongues wagged over the last few years on any topic more than how fascism spreads. It's all over the news, it's all over social media, it's all over this hell site. Oh god, I can already hear you saying, not this again. To which I say, just wait until you've heard the next line I've written. If you look at Germany in the years leading up to the Second World War, hey, there's only so many ways to talk about this. I'll make it quick. I promise. If you look at Germany in the years leading up to the Second World War, you'll find more than a few similarities between how the Nazis gained support and how ISIS gained support. Each arose during times of extreme uncertainty, each blamed that uncertainty on outside peoples, and each promised a salvation from that uncertainty through an appeal to some sort of intrinsic in-group identity. For Germany, that uncertainty sprang from losing a world war, which saw the nation, and by psychological extension, its people, go from being a major and respected power to an impoverished international pariah. Due to effective propaganda, the general German populace believed the Second Reich to be clearly winning the war. It came as a shock, therefore, when Wilhelm II signed Germany's surrender in 1918. The seemingly sudden fall from grace was the predecessor to several difficult and tumultuous years in Germany, with inflation and economic inequality rising at a terrible pace. Though this eventually leveled off and even eventually improved somewhat, the feelings of alienation among many within Germany's working class continued to loom, and the question of who betrayed the empire never fully dissolved. This was infamously the incubator for already rising anti-Semitism, but also for an increasing distrust in the politically diverse democratic government. They look down on you, the NSDAP whispered into those alienated people's ears. They hate you. They stole your country, killed your sons and your brothers and your fathers, left your homeland a breadless hell. They eat steak and get fat from your labor while you starve and freeze and die. Is that right? Are you going to let them treat you that way simply for being born German? For loving the land of your fathers? The details are always the same, even when they differ. Donald Trump's 2016 victory sent shockwaves through mainstream media outlets, and I assume through the coasts and other Democratic holdings. How could this be? How could the polls be so wrong? What happened? Oh, go to hell, Huffington Post! Fuck you, Nate Silver! Oh my god, how could they have been so wrong about this? Of course, if you lived in the rural area of a red state, this probably came as less of a shock to you. I was working in the modern languages department of the small state university I attended at the time. In a town of like 20,000 or so, the university was the only real liberal stronghold for miles and miles around. And even there, in that department of highly educated English and foreign language teachers, Opinions were sharply divided over who should win the election. I do vividly remember, however, that that nudge went to Trump. There are so, so many reasons for why Trump and the broader Republican Party are so popular in the place I grew up, and places like it. There has been a lot of talk of the urban-rural divide in the last few years, and with that, a certain narrative about what rural America looks like and the problems it faces. Talk and endless think pieces. And overwhelmingly, this coverage of the area seems to be taken on by folks who seem to have no idea what the lived experience of growing up in such an area is like, because holy shit do they miss some important bits, like all of the time. According to the media, rural America is poor, aging, uneducated, and entirely white. And certainly, there are some statistical figures to back up those claims. 
but statistics are worthless without context, and moreover, there is significantly more to the story once you actually look at those numbers. I mentioned at the top of this video that my feelings towards the South are deeply complicated. At different times, I have bitched to anyone who will listen, and I've cursed it in private. It's somewhere where racism and bigotry are so deeply ingrained that people don't even realize how racist and bigoted they are. I have bawled while driving down rural roads at the beauty of the place and how much I love all the good parts of it, and how impossible it feels to reconcile all of that with having grown up in a place where non-heterosexuality and gender nonconformance are met with bullying, discrimination, and hate. I have spent a not insignificant amount of time fantasizing about a life lived in Brooklyn or San Fran, running away to somewhere where I can just exist around people like me. But not only can I not even begin to afford to live somewhere like that right now, if everyone like me leaves here, what will become of here? And moreover, why should I have to be the one to leave? Because here is a much more diverse place than it's generally portrayed as. Yes, it is majority white, and yes, it generally votes conservative. But here is where you will also find a statistically significant percentage of America's Black and Latin populations, and, in fact, the majority of Indigenous people. Rural America is also home to a large number of LGBTQ folks and the majority of disabled individuals. When we talk about marginalized communities, though, the unique needs of those in rural areas are almost always left out of the conversation. Hold on to this. We'll come back to it in a sec. Economically, rural America has been bleeding for many years now. Those of us who grew up in areas far from the nearest city were raised on stories of past economic stability as we were driven by empty court squares and long abandoned post offices. However, even in the past decade or so, there has been an obvious decline as rural populations continue to age and employment continues to stagnate or fall. The 2008 recession hurt rural economies in a way that they have still not recovered from. Obama's presidency may have brought employment back to pre-recession levels in urban spaces, but of the 8.2 million jobs added to the U.S. economy from 2011 to 2015, only 3.5% were in rural areas. I personally graduated from high school in 2008. Since then, most of us have moved to one city or another. There simply is very little opportunity back home for anyone. Democrats, despite whatever stereotypes might be attributed to them, have proven time and again that they care very little for the suffering of America's working class. My whole life, I heard the adults around me lament bitterly about Democrat-sponsored trade agreements that sent all of the local manufacturing jobs abroad where corporations could pay exploitatively low wages that undercut anything an American worker would work for. I was in elementary school when NAFTA was put into effect, and I vividly remember many classmates' parents losing their jobs as a direct result. I remember losing friends as their families were forced to move away. Rural communities have been hurting since, and in that time, the DNC has done little to show any care for their economic well-being. Enter the Republican Party. The party of lowering taxes on the rich, the party of ending social welfare programs, the party of defunding education, the party of traditional family values. Sure, their economic policies are in no way beneficial to America's working class, but Neither really are Democrats, so that's a wash. But where the GOP's great advantage lies is in the way they speak to the cultural values held by those in rural areas. And oh boy, getting into that becomes a whole other topic. But for now, let's just say this. Neither party gives a damn for the working class, but the Republicans at least pay lip service to its base, and that goes a long way. 
I want to quickly turn your attention back to interwar Germany again before we synthesize all the information I've just spat at you. When I mentioned the Nazis earlier, I discussed the role that the promise of a strong in-group identity can play in spreading fascism. In general, when we talk about why Germany became fascist, this is the thing that is always focused on. Germans felt betrayed after the war, the Jews became a convenient scapegoat, and this was used to stoke latent hypernationalism within Germany. And yes, all that happened. But again, the situation is a bit more nuanced than that, and we really need to pay more attention to the role economics played in all of it. In his book, The Logic of Evil, The Social Origins of the Nazi Party, West Virginia University's Dr. William Brustein describes the importance material interests played in NSDAP recruitment. Using the records of Nazi Party membership held in Berlin, Brustein comes to the conclusion that, actually, more people joined the Nazi Party because of a promise of greater economic surety than they did for reasons related to identity. This is extremely interesting because the narrative is that German workers were represented by the leftist parties, while the Nazi party was a party for Germany's middle class. While I do think that Brustein's research is pretty flawed in the way it downplays the impact generational anti-Semitism had on the Nazis' popularity, it does do a good job in pointing out that the National Socialist movement was largely comprised of disaffected German workers which, relating back to the types of people who join ISIS, runs parallel with the responsibility seekers. I do not think that all people become fascists for purely economic reasons. Neither do they all become fascists because they are innately prejudiced. I do very much think, however, that the promise of a better, stabler tomorrow is an extremely important factor in fostering fascist thought. It is also critical that the better tomorrow was only ever denied because some other can be blamed for taking it away in the first place. Economic disenfranchisement is the key to getting people to listen, and it is the vehicle through which underlying prejudices are allowed to be brought to light, fostered, and grown. One huge factor in Trump's roaring popularity in rural areas was the way in which he spoke directly to those affected by the perpetual economic uncertainty in those regions. Trump promised to reverse those Democratic-sponsored trade agreements which had lost millions of Americans their jobs and caused an endless landscape of rural towns to dry up into nothing. He promised to bring back steel and manufacturing jobs. He promised to make the needs of American workers come first. There was immediate power in this rhetoric. Rural Americans had been largely ignored by mainstream politicians for decades, their economic situation ever worsening in the meantime. Of course they were going to vote for Trump. Who else were they going to vote for? Hillary? Her husband was the very one who signed NAFTA into existence. Biden? And to get hot, I got a lot of, I got hairy legs that turn, that, 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 that turn uh, um, blonde in the sun. And the kids used to come up and reach in the pool and rub my leg down so it was straight and then watch the hair come back up again. They'd look at it. So I learned about roaches. I learned about kids jumping on my lap. And I've loved kids jumping on my lap. There were many, many people in my life who voted for Trump in 2016. They probably also voted for him in 2020, but I can mostly only speculate that. Even in the early days of the Trump presidency, the way they talked about him was very different from the way they talked about Bush, in that I never heard a negative word on Bush. I heard mostly only bad things about Trump, ranging from asshole to idiot. However, if you asked any of them why they voted for him, the answer was always the same. The economy. Every single Trump voter I have ever spoken to voted for Trump because they believed he could fix the economy, which had been so clearly lopsided against them by democratic liberalism. Or, again, at least they did in 2016. In 2020? Who knows? Has the Trumpian economy been good for rural Americans? Overwhelmingly, 
No. In the four years since he took office, the rural-urban income gap continued to widen. Public lands, an important source of revenue for many rural communities, were sold to the highest bidder. And farmers? Farmers, especially farmers of color, have perhaps been hurt most of all. They were stripped of protections they had had against big agribusiness interests, and billions were lost in farming revenue as a result of the trade wars. Did any of that matter? According to voter surveys, not at all. To the overwhelming majority of Trump voters, the economy is still one of the primary factors for their vote. Regardless of whether the actual material conditions improved for rural voters over those four years, and again, they didn't. The promise of a better economy to come was still enough to motivate them to vote. It was still more than they ever got from the Democrats, after all. Also, side note, I personally know how much it sucks to be told that an individual voted for someone whose policies could be murderous towards people like you just because they like their economics. Every time a Trump voter tells me that they don't like him personally, but they like his economic policy, I want to scream. But it is important to note that not every Trump voter sees themselves as racist or bigoted, even if they directly supported a platform of racism and bigotry. Does that excuse them platforming white supremacy? Absolutely not. But it is still important to be aware of this phenomenon, because this is the Trojan horse through which even worse hate is able to spread through our culture. Let's recap. Fascism thrives in an environment where people feel alienated and or mistreated by wider society, where they feel they've been betrayed by another group, and when their economic security has been threatened. Rural Americans, as a group, often feel as though they are looked down upon by coastal and urban folks, feel they have been betrayed by democratic economic policies, and have had collapsing economic structures for decades. We also touched on the fact that rural communities are not monolithic, but home to a host of marginalized individuals. Finally, we discussed how fascism appeals to the working class, and in doing so, encourages already latent prejudices. See where I'm going with this? When we write off an entire region, we leave it alienated and vulnerable to the far right. Liberal in this part of the world is synonymous with an elitist who hates the poor and struggling hicks who live out in the county, and by extension, so does Democratic Party. There might be things that Trump voters dislike about Donnie, but for all that, they do perceive in him a hope of salvation from that broken world they live in. And all it takes is a movement like MAGA to directly offer those disaffected people a promise of economic salvation by returning to a time in which they were financially more stable. Whether that promise is capped is irrelevant. It is a promise made, and the result is the same either way. Those manifold prejudices already held are inevitably worsened when fascism is given a space to grow. And who will receive the worst, most immediate brunt of the rise of fascism in rural America? The millions of marginalized people who also live there. And that is why it is crucial that we not only listen to the needs and frustrations of rural America, but why we also shouldn't erase the lived existence of its most vulnerable people by painting all of them with a brush that simply says, white, traditional, conservative. Doing so emboldens the worst of the population while simultaneously putting the most marginalized in an even more precarious position. I'm not here to make excuses for the racism that permeates this part of the world. I'm not at all here to center the conversation on how to achieve better equality in this country on the feelings of rural white people. I'm not even here to claim that every bit of inequality in this country can simply be reduced to economics or class. This isn't a video about identity politics or class reductionism. This is, however, a video on how social alienation and economic instability can lead to the spread of fascistic thought, and how social acceptance of fascistic thought universally worsens the underlying prejudices of the people who adopt it. It all becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. 
One is not responsible for the other, but they each do very much feed into one another. When I was growing up, I was raised on stories of my papa fighting a U.S. soldier in a bar, of him outrunning a cop afterwards by turning off the headlights of his Chevelle and driving into a cornfield. I was taught not to trust cops because, at one time, that was the definition of outlaw country. Few, if any, in the culture I grew up in would describe themselves as anarchists, but again, libertarian worked. What I've laid out in this video is the pipeline by which that undercurrent of libertarianism changed to the pro-authoritarian place we know it as today. I mentioned earlier that I once teetered on the edge of fascism. Did I realize any of that? Of course not. I was just an ignorant kid. And I would bet everything that the overwhelming majority of those whose beliefs might be described as fascistic do not see themselves as that at all, would never recognize that in themselves. If the right is the only side that seems to give a damn about you, you're more likely to adopt more right-leaning beliefs. It's just as simple as that. So what do we do about any of this? Those who see themselves as not being part of the right have got to be better about the way they address the needs of rural America. The South, Appalachia, the Southwest, the Midwest, wherever that might be. Because if your idea of good politics is to just say shit like this online, you're doing nothing but chasing internet clout at the expense of pushing even more people towards your ideological enemies. But then again, most people from these communities don't really expect anything from liberals but elitism and scorn anyway. Many on the left, meanwhile, take great comfort in not being like other girl- I'm sorry. Not being like liberals. Leftists are supposed to be the paragons of class consciousness, the people who fight for the people, as it were. Yet I very rarely ever see other leftists addressing rural issues. And from what I've learned in studying more leftist history, this seems to have been the case with large swathes of the left for as long as there has been a left. Right libertarianism was the third way I found back in 2008 or so, when it was clear that neither the Republicans nor the Democrats had anything to offer me. If you speak to rural folks, you'll find that tons of them hold similar views on the two-party system, that they trust neither the DNC nor the GOP to give a shit about them. But Trump has at least paid lip service to their economic needs. The evangelical church at least offers food and clothes and shelter to those who need it, so long as they aren't queer. What has the left done? Rural American leftists are extremely isolated from mainstream leftists in more populous areas. And yeah, part of that can be blamed on the geographic isolation inherent in such areas, but to leave it just at that, it's not good enough. I'm not the only American who became disillusioned with the two-party system and sought out right libertarianism as the alternative, and we cannot let that be unchallenged any longer, because as we've seen, it's ever a hair's breadth away from becoming something far, far worse. Leftist movements are supposed to be bottom-up, to be by the people, for the people. Leftist economic policy is supposed to be explicitly for the betterment of people like those who live in rural America. Leftists themselves love big talk about revolution, but show me just one that worked without the support of rural communities. Real systemic change? It can't be done without the support of rural communities. It can't. But the right understands this, and that should concern all of us. Because next time, when someone shrewder than Trump comes around, it may be too late. This was the most difficult script I've written to date. It's long, yet it barely scratches the surface. I had a very clear vision for where I wanted to go with it when I started, but the more I wrote, the more I realized I had to say. 
I wasn't able to get into the manifold social issues that exist in this part of the world, the psychological structures that set people up to accept a right authoritarian worldview, the sorts of leftist groups that do exist in rural communities. I'd love to talk more about the way other rural leftists feel the, capital L, left treats them and their communities. If you watched this video and thought, ugh, it was fine I guess, but why didn't she talk about X? I can assure you, I probably feel the exact same way. This feels like an extremely incomplete and insufficient essay, but you have to start somewhere and if you do feel like it's lacking, great! You can always leave a comment and feed the algorithm for me, or even more ideally, I encourage you to go and learn more about this yourself. I haven't decided if part two or whatever I'll call it will be the next video or six videos, next month or a year from now, but this isn't the last I'll speak on this topic. And if I can be extra honest for a moment, I've never been more nervous to post a video than I am to post this one. This feels like the sort of thing that could draw as much defensive ire from the people back home as it does from the online left, right, and liberal. But that in and of itself sort of says something and seems worthy of note. Anyway, thank you to those who support my work. If you made it to here, please do actually let me know what you think in the comments, not just for the algorithm, but because I'm not sure how this will be received and I'd love to know what I could do better or what you'd like to hear about next time. And like, share, subscribe, check out my Patreon, follow me on Twitter, all that jazz. God, I hate writing that part in the script. Every. Single. Time. Anyway, here's the stinger I selected for this video. You know, I do this for all my videos, right? Something to consider. Is raising a starvation minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, which has not been raised in 10 years, to $15 an hour a living wage a radical idea? No. Is making public colleges and universities tuition free so that all of our people have the opportunity to get a higher education in a competitive global economy? Is that a radical idea? No. Is doing what every other major country on earth does, guaranteeing health care to all as a right, is passing a Medicare for all single payer system a radical idea? No.